on this blessed day. It's our good fortune to delve into the meaning of space. Something which surrounds us, which pervades us perpetually, but which we hardly notice. Our task now is to notice it, to tend to it, this mysterious, ubiquitous presence. And in Sanskrit, space is called Akash. And Indian philosophy recognizes three kinds of Akash, three kinds of space. There is first Bhutakash, and we might describe Bhutakash as the outer space. The planets all move within Bhutakash, the atoms whirl within Bhutakash. It's the space that contains all physical manifestation. But then there's another kind of space. It's called Man Akash. Inner space. When we turn within, in sleep, or in deep thought, what kind of space enfolds us then? It isn't outer space, but it's inner space, the space within which ideas swim. And it's every bit as vast as outer space. And yet there is a vaster space still, a more ancient space, a space that has always been and will always be, which encompasses outer space and inner space. It's the universal ground, the space of all space, the Chit Akash. So we find ourselves diving into dimension after dimension of space, arriving at last in that space beyond which there is nothing, and which contains everything, outer and inner, physical, mental, spiritual. When the Sufis in India went to translate the word Akash, and when Murshid himself translates the word Akash into the vocabulary of Sufism, the word Asman is chosen. And Asman means sky. A space is a sky. And there are skies within skies. Every place has its sky. A valley has its own microclimate. And that microclimate is part of a larger climate, the climate of a whole continent, which in turn is part of the entirety of Earth's atmosphere. This bubble in space 
enfolding the earth. And earth's atmosphere is embedded within the heliosphere, that great orb surrounding the sun, streaked through with solar rays. While the heliosphere is part of interstellar space, a bubbling interstellar space, swirling with gases and dust. And the interstellar space of the galaxies, what does it float in? In the old mystical language, it is called the nafas rahman the breath, the sigh of the divine compassion, the atmosphere of atmospheres, that great breeze within which worlds are born and worlds die away. an infinite sigh. But right here on Earth, as we look this way and that, we find skies within skies. We find spaces within space. We might speak of space in the ultimate sense of the all-encompassing, or we might speak of a space, a place. You are now in a space, your home. It has a certain character. If someone visits you in your home, they'll immediately feel they've entered into a particular kind of space that has a distinct atmosphere. They might find themselves feeling comfortable there or uncomfortable there, depending who it is. Just as we might be comfortable or uncomfortable going to the house of someone else. Crustaceans have their shells. Birds have their nests. Spaces are shaped. And an atmosphere is imparted to each. We cleanse our house and revivify it by sweeping out the dust by burning incense, by saying prayers. These are different ways to magnetize the space in which we live, because any space can become murky. So every space needs its care. Spaces also merge into other spaces. Sometimes the border is evident. Sometimes the border is gradual and ambiguous. In one place, the sea ends suddenly at the beach. The water ends there amidst the sand and rocks. Elsewhere, the sea mingles with the waters of an estuary and all manner of waterfowl gather there in that brackish water, a barzakh between spaces, a threshold state. Some thresholds are abrupt. 
some are incremental. But the traveler, the mover between spaces, before long recognizes another space is manifesting itself here. Sometimes a particular place is designated by its center, a great ancient tree may constellate a space around it. It's called the omphalos. Each space has a magnetic center, a kutub, a pole. And in every space there is a, a genius loki, the spirit of that place sometimes more than one, but especially one that has a particular responsibility for that place. It might be an invisible being. It might be a visible being. It might be an animal. It might be a human being. Institutions also have them. If you go to the library. You might find in that library someone who has been working there for decades. Someone who knows that library inside and out, knows where every book is. That person is the genius Loki of that space. The memory keeper. But it's not only human beings who do this. Think of the trees that stand as sentinels in the night, watching over a patch of ground. Into the depths of the night, through the brightness of day, in the cold of winter, amidst the blossoms of summer, always there. In the Diwan, which we call the spiritual hierarchy, there are beings like this among the saints and masters who were responsible for certain places. There are some who are responsible for smaller places, there are some who are responsible for larger places, some responsible for whole countries, whole continents. They're the spirits of those places through their prayer, through their remembrance. They magnetize and keep in order the space of which each is the, the pole. When you go into a space, if one is preoccupied with all of one's hopes and fears, then there's a good chance one will not really meet the place, meet the spirit of the place. This kind of whirlwind of thoughts distracts you. But the more empty you can be when you go into a place, the more you immediately sense what is there. Yes, through your outer senses, certainly. But there's a kind of emptiness that inspirits in you the whole history of that place. And even if you were blindfolded and your ears plugged closed, you could sense it. Because the emptiness in you has encountered the space. There's a record there of impressions, what has happened there over the centuries, over the millennia, before this city was built, there were earlier dwellers here. Their lives have left a record, their loves. 
and there are still uh, ancient impressions. And we ourselves are constantly making our mark too. And if one's condition is subtle and attentive, one will be aware not only of the place one is entering and its effect upon you, but also your effect on the place. So we don't just bumble into places. We're in communion with the place that we visit, enter respectfully. Going up a high mountain or riding in a plane and sitting by the window and looking down, you see your city and the surrounding countryside unfold toward the horizon. You see plots of land one after another marked out by roads or paths or hedges or streams as a kind of tapestry of places spaces spread out over the land. And then you realize the land itself is one patch, the sky another, the oceans another, the planets, tracts, the stars, radiant places, all within a vast cosmic landscape, the great chain of being, one might call it, in sacred architecture it's represented by what is called mukarnas, which are the facets in a dome, a cascade of spaces issuing out from the space of all spaces, these many akashas, these many asmans, each is a capacity. And as the Sufis of ancient times would say, the water, the color of the water is the color of the cup. Each alcove is a cup and space pouring into it takes on the color of the vessel. Every space, another vessel for the colorless, the formless. And thus Murshid speaks of capacities, each capacity held up to the ineffable and filtering the immensity of the Absolute according to its particular coloration, its particular vibration. Thus Murshid says, the secret of the whole creation can be traced to the understanding of what is meant by capacity. Capacity is, so to speak, the egg of creation. All of this manifestation which is known to us, as well as that which is unknown to us, is formed in some capacity. The sky is a capacity. Capacity is that which makes a hollow in which the action of the all-pervading existence may produce a substance. All the stars and planets which we have discovered, and those which are not yet discovered, what are they? They are all capacities. And what do they contain? 
they contain, each one according to its capacity, whatever that capacity is able to preserve within it and give birth to. That is why one planet is not like another planet, nor one star like another star. Just as the sea is a capacity in which all the animals of the water are born and live and die, so the air is a capacity in which many creatures live and move and have their being. And the earth is a capacity which conceives within itself the plants, the trees, and all the different stones, metals, minerals, and other substances which come out of it. Again, everything, the stone, the tree, or a fruit, or a flower, is a capacity in which a perfume may be formed, or a savor. So Moshe says here, the earth is a capacity within which trees find space in which to grow. But then the trees themselves are capacities in which birds may nest, insects may crawl, flowers may burst into bloom, and a flower itself is a capacity. However deeper you look, you find capacity within capacity within capacity. Each capacity, each asha, akash, each asman is a part and a whole. Each part is host to parts within itself. Each part is a whole and part of a larger whole. Whether you look minutely into the minutia of the microscopic world or high up into the highest heavens, we find capacities within capacities and none is separable from the others. Each depends upon the capacity within which it indwells and makes room for that which it can host, that which it can sustain within itself. All within the Chit Akash. On the spiritual path, we take step by step, we advance toward the numinous, the horizon of endless becoming. And each valley, each station, each maqam is a capacity. It's a space in which something can be realized. Something can be discovered. Not identical to what we have known before but not yet that which we have not yet reached. It's a particular zone of discovery. Each of us in our own life is situated within a particular maqam that we must now traverse. And there's no going back, there's no going round it. We're here to move through this space. But as every whole has its parts, Within every maqam is a number of halat, a number of states that all constellate the entirety of this station. And we have in us the capacities to recognize successive states, to unfold being and to encounter meaning. And that that capacity consists of a number of organs of perception. Each organ of perception is a capacity, but also there are the subtle organs, the lataif. And Moshet has described these subtle organs as being spaces, like the space inside an apple. The, the flesh of the apple is dense and sweet, but in the middle of it, is this empty space. And when you find that kind of space within your body, 
that's where certain kinds of very subtle sensations can be felt in the empty places within you. And these lataif are in, in turn tuned to different frequencies. Each holds the capacity of what it evokes, what it tunes to. Like the dial of a radio, when you turn it, different frequencies become audible. Each subtle center is tuned to a certain frequency, and that frequency is discovered there. To experience this, one has to hollow out these centers, empty them out. And so the heart is likened to a flute, the neigh, or the bansuri of Lord Krishna. The heart has to be hollowed out so that the breath of the nafas rahman can blow through it. Holes are made, apertures, so that a melody can be produced. A lute also must be empty, otherwise no sound comes from it. It's the emptiness that brings the capacity for vibration and sound. Moshit says, the human heart is first to read, and the suffering and pain it goes through make it a flute which can then be used by God as the instrument to produce the music that God constantly wishes to produce. But, not every, but every reed is not a flute, and so every heart is not God's instrument. As the reeds need to be made into flutes, so the human heart can be turned into an instrument and can be offered to the God of love. And that is the true purpose of the heart. That is the true aspiration of our inner being, to be a vessel for the Divine Presence, to be a shrine for God's indwelling. The Prophet spoke words that came as a revelation from from God and these words are words of Hadith Qudsi I am contained in no thing but I am contained in the heart of the sincere worshipper who loves me what could contain the enormity, the infinitude of the Absolute. We, we are so small. We are so ephemeral. How could we imagine that we could encompass that immensity? And yet, the prophetic message tells us this, that this is our very vocation, our true purpose to become so empty that the all and everything can find a home in this heart. Just as the pupil of the eye is so small, but the whole surrounding landscape, a great prospect, is reflected. It's because of the receptivity of this little pupil. So Moshit said, when you make yourself an akasha for God to be enshrined in, that is the only purpose for which this body was made. It was made that God might take charge of it, might be awakened in this body. By doing this, one fulfills that purpose. One opens this place for God. One makes it the place for God and says, Now you be 
enshrined in this place. It belongs to you. You made it.